In this video we want to take a look at potential ways to organize our project data for open roads and corridor modeling in our Select Series 4 environment. And this would apply to Geopack inroads or MX of course. Taking a look here at the screen is a potential of how we can set up our folder structures for example terrain modeling, geometry, etc. You may have other folders in here as I would expect. But one of the things we're talking about in this video is how we can break apart disciplines to allow multiple people to work on those projects but yet still be able to pull it all together for both plans production as well as for generation of automated machine guidance control and specifically three-dimensional modeling. So the first thing we want to do is to again take a look at our folder structure and to separate out our primary parts of our project to what makes sense in terms of our internal disciplines. The most important thing however to remember is this is just an example and may not be the best case in your particular situation and it depends on how many people need to be working on this particular project that you're setting up. So the first thing I want to take a look at in this organization is the train model or the discussion of survey and or terrain modeling. Typically this is going to be done in a singular file unless it's a massive project that is broken out into major survey situations maybe for example a 100 mile or 200 kilometer type job. But in most situations where you have a particular job site you can generally speaking set your terrain model up in one file. The recommendation here would be that this is going to be a 3D file so if we take a look at this and throughout this video the data is actually going to be already present it's more about organization just one tip here on your terrain model once you get your terrain model created and ready for the actual design side you may want to set the feature definition on it to something like existing boundary uh, using the examples workspace where the contours would be there if they manually select that terrain and they turn them on but set the default where the contours and or triangles are not going to get in the way for the proposed design work and just a, a little tip and then so once you have that train model the way you want it with the proper feature definition set you can save those settings and then that will be able to be referenced in to work on your geometry etc. To take a look at geometry to provide maximum flexibility to our designers one of the things that we would ask that you consider is to put each alignment in its own DGN file. You will see in my geometry folder I have a north-south geometry.dgn and an east-west geometry.dgn file each with the alignment set in it. And So let's go ahead and just open one of those. So some things to point out in this north-south geometry alignment is we have the active alignment of north-south here if I select that, I can work on that, I can modify it, I can open the profile model, for example. But the east-west alignment is actually referenced into here. And so you'll see that that is on reference 3, shown down here in our reference dialog. The other thing that I have noted here is the existing train model is referenced in. And so if I highlight that one, what you have to do is when you reference that train model in initially, you want to select that train model and set it as active and I've already done that here. Once you've set that train model active what that will do is create a 3D model in this 2D geometry file and that is a recommendation best practices each of your geometry files are going to be 2D. And so we can set that basically to a display only uh, for the uh, train model once it's active and then on the east-west what I did is essentially all you really need there again is display only and where you can work on your north and south alignment at will. The other thing to note here is the 3D model that is created uh, right now that it's not actually displayed. If you really need to see that in your 2D design window you can certainly turn that on but for the most part I found your 3D model you can typically turn that off. And so this is how we've structured an individual file of our geometry. Regarding our nesting depth settings in the way that we have set up our geometry and again we're in our north-south file here. If you take a look at for example the existing terrain there is no nesting set for that. Also on the east-west geometry no nesting because we don't need to be more than 
one level deep. We're simply looking at the geometry in that terrain and in those other geometry files. In the same way with our 3D model that is automatically generated, if we have nesting set there, we can go ahead and turn that off. And if you want to see your nesting hierarchy, there is an icon here that shows the hierarchy. And if you have nesting, you'll see uh, subfiles underneath the files listed here. And so just pay very close attention to your nesting. And I'll be talking about nesting at each uh, step along the way because that does become rather important in terms of keeping the optimized views available for the user so that they don't have to turn things on and off at multiple uh, file level layers. With all of our individual geometry files created in our example here, east, west, and north, south, it would be nice at one point to be able to open one file and look at all geometry. And that's what we've done here is to create an empty two-dimensional file called all geometry. And so let's open that up. In our all geometry file, you'll notice both of our alignments are in here. But what I wanted to point out is I have simply referenced the default model, not the default 3D model, but just the default model. And notice there is really not a reason again to show our nesting here. And so I have both of them set at a nesting depth of zero with snap and locate turned on. And so if I needed to examine all of my geometry in one location or perhaps plot my geometry this would be a good way to do that and if we take a look at the hierarchy here you will see that there again are no nesting depths displayed in this particular situation and this theme that we're looking at here in terms of making what I call a container file we will do the same concept for super elevation for corridors etc and it just is in a way that we can do a simple reference of all of the individual particular files now we'd like to take a look at each of our individual corridors for design. In our example, we have a north-south corridor, we have a east-west corridor, and then again, pertaining to the same concept that we did with geometry, I have an all corridors file, which is essentially a blank file that references everything in. So let's take a look at a corridor and see what references we need and what are those nesting depths. The first thing the user is going to want to do in your 2D file is reference in your existing terrain file and set that to the active terrain surface and then turn off the snap and locate. So that's step one. In our north-south corridor then the second thing we want to do is to reference in all of geometry. That needs to be a nesting depth of one because all of geometry itself is empty. It's a container file so we need to get back to the alignments. And so by setting that to a depth of one uh, will allow us access to those. And then the other thing that I did here is because I needed to work on my intersections and I needed to access the east-west corridor, I went ahead and referenced the east-west corridor again with a nesting depth of zero. Now one thing that you're going to notice, as I did in my example, when I had my north-south corridor designed and I referenced in my east-west to work on my intersections, I referenced into my 2D model, my 3D model of my east-west corridor did not show up. That's actually to be expected in the way the software is designed. The 3D model is not going to show up until something is processed to force it to show up. So if you want the default 3D model to show up, for example, on the east-west corridor, you can select that model, go ahead and reference in the east-west corridor, the default 3D model, and again with your nesting depth set to no nesting, and you can force that to show up. If we'd like to be able to see all of our corridors in one file, I created this empty container file. It's a 2D file called All Corridors, you can see here. And what I did is first, again, as always with all new files, I referenced in my existing train with a nesting depth of zero. I set that train model active, and then I turned off Snap and Locate. This automatically creates a 3D model of all corridors, and then I went ahead and turned off its display, Snap and Locate. We don't need that on to see in our 2D. Then I manually referenced in the east-west and the north-south corridor files and so these actually can both be set to a nesting depth of zero so I'll go ahead and change that and what that does is bring in our planet metrics here as you can see and then on the the default 3D model uh, you can see that I have those in here as well 
Uh, you can choose to manually reference those as you want. I, you can see that I've turned those off completely. If you needed to see the 3D model in 2D, again, I just referenced the 3D model over here. And then, of course, I also brought in all geometry, and that does need to be a nesting depth of one to be able to get access to our alignments. And then over here in our 3D model, uh, it's quite simple. We have the existing terrain, which was automatically created for us when we set the model active. And then I manually referenced in the east-west and the north-south 3D uh, model of that particular file so that I could see that model without requiring any processing for it to show up. So that's how I organized uh, my all corridors file in including the nesting depth settings. Thinking about plans production, I'm in the all corridors file. If I turn on off my construction class with the F7 key in the examples workspace, I want to point out how our proposed edge of pavement that is generated from our corridor is still going to be plotted in our file and is a continuous element and there's no way that we can break that because that element is a child of that particular north-south corridor. So even though we place civil cells for the intersections, uh, we still have this situation where this comes through. And so the only way that we can send this information to the plotter is to you take advantage of a planimetrics file where this information is not there. So let's op take a look at that. So if I go to my folder structure here. I'm going to have a folder here called plans production and in this is a planimetrics.dgn file. And in this planimetrics.dgn file one of the things you're going to notice is I've introduced a taper and a right turn lane on the east-west corridor that's not going to be present in our east-west corridor file right now because we just ran a straight 12 foot edge of pavement all the way through and so we're going to use our planimetrics file which is essentially what we're going to send to our plotter we can put our notes on here uh, cut our planner profile sheets etc this is a basically a manually created uh, file full of geometry uh, with geometric rules that allows us then to go ahead and basically lay out those graphics as the way they are on our design project so in my planimetrics file I only have one reference and that's all geometry with a nesting depth of one and this allows me to lay out my edges of pavement, my curb and gutter, sidewalk, etc. and you'll see just an example here. So let's jump over to our east-west corridor. What we want to do in our east-west corridor is reference in the planimetrics and I'm going to go ahead and turn on the display snap and locate and immediately you're going to see we have a difference from the edge of pavements curb and gutter a sidewalk that was produced from the corridor lines versus what was shown in our planimetrics which we know to be is the final answer. If I turn off my construction class here it's a little bit easier to see with the F7 key I have my construction class toggled and then the F10 key will actually toggle in between showing the reference files as, as full strength in terms of draw or to dither them so F10 key is very useful in the examples workspace and so you'll see that our reference file of our planimetrics here is not lining up with the graphics from our corridor. Utilizing the planimetrics file to drive our corridor design is very useful in this situation and, and to fix this situation in the east-west corridor we would assign a point control to the alignment generated from the planimetrics file to make sure that the edges of pavement then line up. So with those changes to add a point control in the east-west corridor to follow the planimetrics line, if I press now for example my F10 key, you will see how we dither the references and the planimetrics is now underneath the east-west corridors and you can see that it all lines up together nicely. Now let's take a look at our super elevation. You'll see here in my folder structure that I have a super elevation file for my north-south alignment as well as my east-west alignment. I think this is good practice and allows multiple users to be able to develop super elevation. The one thing that I do have a hard time justifying here though is the need to bring all super elevation files into a combined super elevation file. It's possible you might have a distinct need for that situation, but in my case I'm going to omit that step as it would just simply re repeat what we've already done on the geometry in the corridors. So let's show you in the north-south super elevation file what I've done. The first thing you want to do when you're working in open roads in your super elevation is you need to go ahead and change your active microstation uh, symbology and in the examples word workspace I have a draft corridor super elevation level color style weight 
It does use the active microstation symbology now to generate the symbology for the super elevation. Taking a look at what I did regarding the reference files, I simply referenced in all geometry with a nesting depth of 1 and I referenced in all corridors also with a nesting depth of 1 in my super elevation file. I went ahead and applied the super elevation. I turned on the fill attributes and so I've done it here for the north-south uh, particular alignment and then I also heated that process on the east-west alignment and applied super elevation there as well. Then if we take a look at our actual corridor, so over on the north-south corridor here, I then simply referenced in that super elevation with a nesting depth of zero and applied it then to the corridor to be able to see our super elevation applied to our corridor. Regarding the recommendations on the template library, this one gets to be a little bit tricky, but here are a couple of tips when you're sharing project work with other users. Number one, first and foremost, and this should be done for every project, is isolate your agency standards in a folder by themselves. That way if a agency does make updates during the life cycle of a process. You can use the uh, template library organizer up here and drag that entire folder structure over from an updated agency library. The second thing I strongly suggest is to create a project folder within your template library and then each individual user have their own folder structure. Why do I suggest this? Well, you might actually need to have multiple copies of a template library for different designers because you can only have this opened by one person at a time and everybody working on a corridor is going to need access to those templates. And so if everybody keeps their own des designer name folder structure, then when the project's all completed, all you have to do is use the library organizer and copy all of the different uh, designer folder structures over from the different users to one master template library. So it, it may not be the best in your particular situation, but just something as a workflow to consider uh, to allow people from overriding each other's work. In conclusion, the first thing you have to ask yourself is how many people are going to be working on the project. If it's a small project with one or two people, then breaking things up into the order of magnitude we've done in this example may not be necessary. If it's going to be multiple people working on this project, then this approach will give you your maximum flexibility. Uh, the other major thing is to remember to really keep close tabs on the settings for your nesting depths because you want to keep those as tight as possible and only use nesting when it's absolutely necessary. Uh, for example, in this north-south corridor when we reference all geometry, well we know that that model is empty, uh, but to get to individual geometry files we have to go one reference file deep and that's why that one's set to one. And so make sure that you're paying attention to what those are set to. Also, on your reference files, make sure, am I in the 3D model, as we see here, or am I in the 2D design, which is where you'll typically be doing all of your work. So make sure when you're attaching reference files and setting nesting depths that you're in that proper model first. Again, these recommendations are not set in stone. It's just a way to kind of give you an approach or a thought process as to how you can produce plans production and also be able to produce your model and be able to work with them together as a unit with multiple designers.